So thank you everyone for being here, for joining me. Um, as Shay said, uh, sorry in advance for the glitch. Uh, I really spent uh, some time trying to figure out uh, how to fix it, but couldn't. So I hope you like my wallpaper if you get to see it. Okay, so if you had access to the abstract, you already know the plan for this talk. Uh, I'll get you through an overview of uh, relating logics, followed by a brief overview of Nelson's connect connected logic, and then uh, we'll get into the details for the semantics, followed by some closing remarks. So, if we're lucky, this will be short and sweet. So, um, well, I can tell you a little about this project because uh, I'm really excited about it, right? So uh, this all started when my advisor, Thomas Ferguson, was kind enough to uh, receive me in his home in, uh, in Austin. And so we were trying to figure out uh, how the hell does one write a full dissertation on connective logic, right? So he actually had this pretty cool idea that was uh, to give us semantics. Uh, for Nelson's logic. At that time, we were ambitious and bold and wanted to do this uh, with determinate relations. But then I was younger, I knew less about life, and it was really, really difficult, right? So um, I actually left this project like hanging for a couple of months because I had no idea of how to proceed until uh, we had this visit uh, from Heinrich Manzing. And he suggested that I should look at this stuff about uh, Boolean connective logic and relating semantics and should try to uh, give our rela relating logic style semantics to Nelson's logic before, you know, like jumping into the ocean of ternary relation semantics. So here's the result. Uh, I hope you like it. So, okay, um, relating logics, uh, they are, a very simple concept to grasp. Uh, they simply incorporate a notion of relatedness in your model. Uh, and that lets us introduce uh, intentional connectives in a very straightforward way. The only thing uh, we need to do is to add a rela relation R to the standard model for classical logic. So our relation R will take formulas as its argument and it will receive each valuation according to any sort of constraints uh, we wish to impose on R, right? So, usually uh, what is considered is that since R is taken to relate like to different things, I guess, as opposed to a thing with itself or, I don't know, but they usually used to have uh, extensional binary connects connective, right? So I was surprised to find negation missing. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this could be done to negation as well. It's just like, I mean, I guess people find it really weird that negation uh, has to do with uh, relations between a pair of formulas rather than a formula with itself. I don't know. Um, I'm excited to try. So, I've been thinking about this a bit, uh, like why wouldn't we have negation as an intentional connective? Uh, I haven't gone very far into it, but I'm definitely interested in the question. And so the most prominent examples I can give you uh, of relating logics are in a paper by Epstein from 1979, who was, I think, the first one to write extensively on this topic. And uh, what he considers is just like a logic with extensional vocabulary from classical logic and then an intentional connective, which has the truth condition for the conditional, but also requires the satisfaction of a relation R. Um, he does not specify any specific properties for R because like his paper is, to be, is, is meant to be like super general, so, one of the, the upsides of R is that it's supposed to be really flexible. 
And so the only thing he tells us is that uh, it just has its own satisfaction conditions. Um, also, as a fun fact, uh, Epstein says that the reason that he calls these logics relating logics and why he uses the, the notion of relatedness instead of relevance is because by that time it was, uh, it was already in use and had already a technical meaning, right? So he, was, he wanted to like keep those notions separate. And the, sep the second example is, is quite similar. The only difference is that uh, these guys like consider the inclusion of a conjunction that also satisfies R so that we get interdefinability of the conjunction in terms of the, the arrow. So, and again, uh, in this case, the properties of R also aren't specified because uh, the point of the of having relating logics is that uh, it, can give in, it can be given any philosophical purpose one likes. So they just like give a bunch of technical results uh, for this intentional vocabulary without assuming anything special about R. Okay, so it is in a further paper that uh, they focus on the, the special case of uh, fully connected logics. So the difference here is that uh, the semantics, like especially the, the relation R is specified in such a way that it validates the most commonly accept, accepted connected principles. Um, I should really have, a, I should really like, I just realized that I need, a, I, it, it would have been a good idea to have a slide with the connected principles. So I'll just like fast forward for a bit and use this one. Uh, so the, what we will call the most accepted connected principles in this talk are these four principles. The first two are commonly called Aristotle's thesis. And basically they say that no formula should imply its own negation. And the other two are called Boethius' thesis. Uh, and um, well, they're basically the constructive form of Aristotle's thesis and state that uh, if a formula is related either with B or its negation, then it cannot be uh, related with the other member of the contradictory pair. Right, so uh, our focus will be on these principles. There are many others. Luis and I have a paper on this. If we take A1 to be Aristotle's thesis, then the variant is supposed to say that it's not the case that not A implies A. Okay. So though that is my like connective logics 101. Um, and then to do this, like to define a logic with, that validates the connective principle, find a set of propositional variables, um, the usual set of connects, of extensional connectives. Um, it is not really mentioned in this paper in Boolean connective logics, but I guess you can have a material implication as well, right? There's nothing keeping you from defining a material implication from negation and disjunctions if you, uh, if that's your preferred choice. Uh, same thing goes with the deconditional. And then uh, the only thing we'll need from the intentional set of connectives will be a conditional. And then we'll just need uh, a relation that satisfies properties A1, A2, B1, B2, and possibly C1. We'll go like into detail on all those uh, all these properties like later in the talk. So, well, there we go. Uh, in order to, in order to guarantee our school's thesis, uh, we need like no contradictory pairs in a relation, right? So, um, I guess that they're mentioned separately because of clarity and because of correspondence uh, with the Aristotle's thesis, but also because you might want 
your relation not to be reflexive. So, I mean, not to be symmetric, sorry. And so in that case, uh, what will happen is that you will need like to specify both properties separately. Uh, same thing goes with uh, the second property in each B1 and B2. And then um, you really just need one side of the, con of, uh, the conditional for both properties. Like the only, uh, you only need to specify that a and B not being in, I mean, A and B being in R implies that A and not B are not in R. And then, um, as we have already seen, if your relation satisfies each of these four properties, you'll have uh, the four connective principles as theorems in your logic. We'll uh, this notation will appear several times, like going forward. Um, when it's, it's next to a V, like V comma R models something, means that you need that specific evaluation in order to model whichever formula appears on the other side of the turnstile. And we have, when we have just the R, it means that um, for any evaluation, this holds, right? So just want, wanted to put that out there. And finally, um, we do not really need uh, our R to be closed under negation, but it's desirable. In particular, uh, in this paper, the, the use that closure under negation is put to is to prove these correspondence theorems, uh, because otherwise you only get one direction, right? If your R satisfies the properties, then you'll have the, the thesis as theorems, but not the other way around. And if you guarantee and you wanna simplify the proof of the correspondence theorem, then you need to, your relation to be closed under negation. And um, it is also, I think, a pretty elegant and straightforward way to get your intentional conditional to contrapose. So, well, there you go, see one. Um, however, Having C1 as a property of R also adds this theorem, which is, it is not the case that A implies B and not B, and it is not the case that not A <laughs> implies not B. So it's just basically what, sort of what closure and their negation states, like at the level of the relation, but in the object language. And then uh, this paper has a bunch of technical results, which include uh, independence proof for all uh, for the five uh, properties. So even if you have a connected logic, uh, in terms of satisfying uh, ourselves and voices thesis, you can have uh, uh, that logic not be closed under negation, and this formula right here won't be a theorem, right? So. I actually hadn't realized that until like yesterday probably that um, I was assuming that I would be, I would need the semantics to be closed under negation, but it might be a property I don't really use in the models. And also I haven't really made sure that um, this holds. So it just occurred to me that if you can actually prove like this theorem axiomatically from the axioms of Nelson's logic, then you might as well not have closure under negation in the models. So another very interesting uh, result that appears in this paper, Boolean Connected Logics, is that there are 32 logics that can be ordered according to the amount of properties uh, that the relation satisfies. So you'll get, uh, well, now I'm not so sure, it's just, it's just 32. I'm assuming that they um, consider that R satisfies like some sensible properties such as um, reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. So given, let's say that given any set of um, of, pro of previously specified properties of R, then we'll have 32 logics 
uh, that can be ordered from non-connexive to fully connexive, right? We'll have the logic that satisfies all the, the non-connexive properties and that is not closed under negation. And then we'll have the very same R but closed under negation. And then we'll have 28 logics for team that satisfy a subset of the properties needed for the connective principle. And then for those, we'll have an extra logic which satisfies that same subset and is also closed under negation. And finally, uh, we'll have um, two R's, one that is fully connective because it satisfies all of A1, A2, B1, and B2. And then the other one, which obviously um, satisfies the whole set of connective properties. Mm, so I guess that's it, unless anyone has any like clarificatory question on the subject of relating logics. I think it's pretty easy to understand, pretty straightforward. So we can go on uh, with uh, and change the subject and get into uh, Everett Nelson's connected logic. So I really like this. I really like this paper, Intentional Relations by Nelson. I I remember reading it and liking it really much, uh, very much. And I didn't really think that I would be writing anything about it, much less providing a semantics for the logic, which is one of the reasons uh, this project. Um, uh, I'm so proud of this project. So. Uh, we'll specify the language, which is uh, a set of prop propositional variables. The set of extensional connect connectives. Uh, I'm guessing that he considers the full set of extensional connectives just because uh, there tends to be a lot of discussion on the validity of addition, simplification, and antilogism for material implications. So. I'm just gonna, we're gonna see uh, in the axiomatization that it, it doesn't feature a lot of extensional connectives except from negation. But I'm assuming that one can have them if one so desires. And then the other thing is that he does consider a full set of binary intentional connectives. Once again, I don't think that he was considering that negation was something that required for a formula to be related with another formula. Um, maybe not even itself, given that he considers, like I'm considering that the negation he's talking about is uh, extensional rather than intentional because it behaves just as extensional negation does. But since he was interested in defining entailment and having uh, an actual connection of meaning uh, between the antecedent and the consequent, then he characterizes uh, negation as contradiction, where the negation of a formula just means the contradictory of A. He's very cryptic in, in some places, so I took this decision to consider negation as, as extensional rather than intentional because I rather, other than that really obscure exposition, I didn't really find reasons to consider otherwise. Um, but this is the connective, like this, this extensional education will be the connective that will be featured, for instance, in the interdefinability of the connectives, right? So we have a full set of intentional connectives and uh, we can get them all from the consistency connective, which is this circle over here, which uh, we will see behaves sort of like a conjunction, but not quite. Um, but as I state in this slide, uh, I have grown convinced that uh, Nelson actually meant to define two conjunctions so that we would get like the full set of connectives just like by using that conjunction and the same negation for both cases. 
So if this is the case, it, like the most sensible thing to do would be to explain um, each of these connectives separately and then go on to the details about the semantics. Um, and as you can see, I'm not, a, I'm not very friendly with conjunctions, right? I think they're boring or at the very least, we, we pretty much know how they're supposed to go, right? The only thing that's important is the true values. So they will only be true if uh, both conjuncts are true. Uh, there's not really too much to say about it. So we can turn our attention to the intentional connective. I also think that this is one of the things I like most about this logic. Uh, it is based on a very particular conception of, of consistency. It differs from the Lewisian sense um, in that it, should be, it shouldn't be understood as joint possibility. I, I do think there is a modal component in Nelson's logic, but it's, it's I think, a very subtle difference. And I think, hopefully, you'll see how that gets through to the semantics, where we do not have, um, like, false consistency statements because both components of the, of the formula are false, right? It is also different in that way from Russell's uh, sense of consistency in that um, two statements which are consistent have to be always true together. Uh, and the thing is that in some way or, not, or another, one can get to the conclusion that uh, impossible propositions cannot be consistent with themselves according to this account. And uh, then Nelson did think this was the case. So he's supposed to be reversing the intuition be behind the usual accounts of consistency, uh, which state that if we know the proof value of a pair of sentences, then we can find out whether they are consistent or not. Um, he doesn't think this is the case. He thinks that you, you can have uh, two false statements or one true and one false, and then still have those statements be consistent. Uh, what you do have is that if you know that A and B are inconsistent, then you can conclude that at least one of them will be false. And the way you figure out which one of them is false is a matter of meaning rather than of uh, truth values, I guess. So with this in mind, um, I, I really didn't know how to condense like a definition for consistency in a way that wasn't the satisfiability condition I already used and that we will see, uh, we will eventually get to when I show you the semantics. And I don't think Nelson is able to either. Uh, my only option, and as you can see, I desisted, was to use his explanation, which was a table in which he goes on considering uh, case by case what happens with two statements according to whether they are true or false and possible or necessary. Um, the summary version is that two impossible statements can be uh, consistent, two logical truths, like two necessarily true statements are always consistent, and the matter of contingent truth varies according to your metaphysics. He has this book, very mysterious note, uh, footnote which states something like that, that your views on um, consistency and contingent statements will depend on your views about whether reality is consistent or not. So, I've taken a very liberal view, I guess, 
were, I don't know, I don't actually know if this is the conservative or liberal view. I guess it's more the conservative one that we can always determine whether the two statements are consistent or not by looking at their models. And so if you can build a model in which they both are true, um, they will be consistent. And if you can't, like if in, for every model where this uh, two formulas appear, you have that one is true and the other is false, then they are probably inconsistent. So then we have the axiomatization for the logic. Um, as you can see, it's pretty straightforward. We have identity for the arrow, uh, symmetry for inconsistency. Um, we have double negation introduction and the double negation elimination can actually be proven from the action. So we actually get both sides. And then we get this, which is the only contra-classical action, so to speak, because if we read this as a conjunction, then we'll find out that this is not a theorem in classical logic, uh, because no implication implies the, the conjunction of its components, right? So this is the only proof we'll go over because it's very interesting and because, well, this is what puts the contra-classical flavor into Nelson's logic. Um, then we have restricted transitivity because uh, at least in that time, like after writing his dissertation and at the time he wrote intentional connectives, I mean intentional relations, uh, Nelson was very keen on eliminating simplification for the conjunction from uh, a decent theory of entailment. So the reason why he imposes this restriction on transitivity is because if you substitute Q or R for another one of uh, your formulas under consideration, then you will get uh, an instance of simplification. If I replace the Qs for Ps, then I will get uh, P implies P, which it's, it's a logical proof. And I don't know if Nelson, I think he would not be, he would not be keen on saying that this is devoid of meaning, but maybe that it's not, it's, not really interesting because because whatever it's meaning it's is it's compatible with like pretty much every other sentence so not only that it just doesn't seem to be used anymore like q implies r will turn into p implies r just like in the consequence so he like made every single effort to make sure that um, instances of simplification or things that look like simplification will pop up in his system. Uh, later on, he decides that maybe it's not such a good idea. Um, he changes his mind and decides that maybe we do need a little bit of simplification in our lives. I don't really understand why, but I think that's material from another paper, so <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to make, wanted to make this clarification as to where this restriction on transitivity comes from. Um, then we have symmetry for the extensional conjunction and antilogism, the only two axioms, and I think, no, perhaps there's a theorem or two where the extensional vocabulary also appears. But because I, I think we get um, no, we don't get addition. No, I think yeah, the only connect, the only extensional connective that actually appears in in these reactions and in the subsequent theorems that Nelson states is conjunction. So I don't know. I think that's that's interesting. At least if because he made that extra effort, right? Like to discuss um, 
the place of extensional conjunctions in a theory of entailment. Um, oh, sorry. And so we finally get into the semantics. So the first thing I did like, when I was just starting out was to define satisfiability condition in the in this style of um, of Boolean connective logic. And so I also wanted to preserve like the spirit of Nelson's discussion uh, in part just to see if I really got it because it's, it's some difficult stuff. I mean, the writing is quite obscure at places. So I was telling you how I wasn't really able to uh, state like a definition for consistency in a straightforward way. And uh, it is because now I can stop thinking about it like, just like it appears in this slide as um, a connective that requires both components to be true or that their meanings be compatible. So what you'll have is some sort of uh, conjunction. Well, at least I find it straightforward to call it a conjunction because it shares the extensional satisfiability condition with extensional conjunction. But also you will get um, that it can be one or the other. You can either have a truth functional, like you can have both components being true, which will guarantee that they are compatible, or you can, like if you're in a model where one of them is false, but you happen to know that their meanings are actually compatible, given certain other constraints that maybe are present in your model, but not in the model where both statements are true, then you know that those are compatible. So I think that most of the strangeness uh, and what's unusual about Nelson's ideas about consistency uh, really shines through um, the satisfiability condition. Uh, I don't know, I think it reflected the ideas, um, the philosophical ideas behind this are pretty well, right? And it also provided um, a straightforward way to interdefine, like obtain the other two connectives by interdefinability. So you can see that the satisfiability condition for inconsistency is just the negation of the satisfiability condition for consistency. And then as we saw previously, um, Nelson considers that entailment is basically means that A entails B just in case A is incompatible with this negation. So what I've done here is just to replace uh, like the condition so it reflects the behavior of a conditional. And then I replaced uh, the negation of B for B in the definition of inconsistency. So I don't know, I really like that because um, not only it reflected uh, the philosophical ideas, but it also like provided uh, easy interdefinitions and also, the, the conditional ended up behaving at least truth functionally like one. So that was an extra. And then, well, I needed to specify some non-connected properties in order, especially in order to provide proofs for all of the, of every single action basically, except, um, if P implies Q, P implies Q implies that P is consistent with Q. So I decided to go uh, with reflexivity symmetry, um, the same restriction on transitivity, because uh, 
I realized that having full transitivity for R would probably allow me to prove uh, full transitivity for the arrow as well, and I didn't want that. Then for the axioms featuring conjunction, um, I had to consider an analog of uh, conjuncting simplification with R. Um, and then there was this bit we were talking about, which says that if there's evaluation that makes both A and B true, then their meanings are compatible. And finally, but as I say, as I said, I don't really know if this is needed uh, anymore. Uh, I had included closure under negation. So, given our previous discussion on relating logics, um, I needed to include just enough properties for R to satisfy all of A1, A2, B1, and B2. And then, um, well, I set out to do my proofs and everything was working great. As I told you, we are only going through one proof and then I want to clarify in advance that it's a proof in the meta language uh, of the logic, uh, but I decided to use the object language just because I have to fit like a rather long proof on two slides. And I thought that would maximize clarity, but it is, it is supposed to be uh, the meta language, which as far as I can tell is completely classical. And I would really like it to stay that way. So that being said, uh, we can go over the, the proof. Um, so the first step was looking at the satisfiability conditions for the arrow and for the consistency connected, right? And it was pretty obvious that uh, to get from one point to another, then the only thing, like the most straightforward way to get from implies to is consistent with was to take one of the conjuncts from the satisfiability condition for the arrow and then make it into a disjunct for the consistency connected satisfiability condition. Um, and then, well, I think it's quite obvious that the extensional bits from both definitions will get us nowhere because they're basically the definitions for material implication and the extensional conjunction. And we simply cannot get uh, from one to the other unless we know A is true, right? So it was, uh, I think my, my first, I did make a first attempt at proving that. And I actually like thought about it for a couple of hours until I realized it was almost like having half a proof missing. So the only obvious path towards a proof was to take uh, the clauses about R from both definitions and try to get from one to the other one. And well, the only strategy available was to add a further property to R, which stated that if A and B weren't in R, then A and the negation of B were. So, if you get that into uh, the, the constraints for R, the proof for the axiom uh, runs quite smoothly. So this is the, tr the truth functional bit. Um, and basically what you do is that you simplify the intentional clause, like the clause about R from the definition and then by one application of this property that if A and B are not in R, then the negation of, of B is, well, that and double negation, you get um, to this, to the intentional clause uh, for consistency, then you add the other disjunct, and then there you go. Um, the intentional bit is a little bit more complicated just because you have to relate an implication uh, with uh, the negation of a consistency. And 
it is really not obvious how to go about like justifying uh, that the meanings of molecular sentences are are related. Um, my approach in this particular case, it was, I think, to prove that there is a contradiction. So, what I did was to take, uh, again, uh, the the intentional clause from the satisfiability condition for the arrow. And then I, since this is simply inconsistency, like you can easily replace uh, the negation and the consistency connected for a bar for inconsistency, then you will get the, the intentional clause for inconsistency as well. And then from that, you'll get a, a contradiction. Um, and so, although it looks quite tricky, it turned out to be more or less straightforward. But I realized a couple of days ago, actually, in preparation of this talk, that having the, exactly that property also allows uh, want to prove uh, the converse of Boethius' thesis, which is that not being the case that A implies B implies that A implies not B. And many people have found this uh, philosophically questionable because maybe, uh, I mean, both Aristotle, um, I guess the variant of Aristotle doesn't work. At least Aristotle and uh, both versions of Boethius uh, just like tell you what shouldn't happen uh, once something happens, right? So Aristotle tell, tells you if, that if you, if you have A, if you know A is true, then that simply can't imply that not A is true. Or that if you have an implication between A and B, then you simply should not have an implication between A and the negation of B, or vice versa, right? If uh, A implies the negation of B, then it shouldn't imply B. But uh, in this case, we're starting from a negative uh, condition. And so hyperconnectivity is fine in some context. Um, I don't think Nelson was thinking about it. Um, I don't know that for instance, one could give a justification like you'll get a uh, system of connexive logic where you simply replace the satisfiability, like the falsity condition for the for implication for something like this. And then uh, you'll get, I know that's another straightforward way towards uh, connectivity, but only because you're starting out from hyperconnectivity. So even if it's fine, if it has been discussed, it's something that um, I do not think it's appropriate for this context. And also because uh, you are not really able to prove, like axiomatically prove uh, the converses of the Boethius thesis without very strange and suspicious suppositions. So, I, re I actually attempted this because it would be it it would have been an even an even more exciting finding like that Nelson's connect, uh, Nelson's connective logic was hyperconnective all along, but uh, this seems not to be the case. So the models being hyperconnective was actually bad news that I found like forty hours ago. Um, <laughs> so I started to. To, to think about a solution. And then I, I ended up going, um, I ended up using a strategy that I had considered long ago because it like matched more closely like um, these papers by these Polish guys, which was to take, basically take their satisfiability condition for implication, which is also the one that appears in, in 
Epstein's papers. And then we'll just go with that. Uh, because when we do this, the proof for P implies Q implies that P is consistent with Q becomes so straightforward, it almost feels like cheating, right? So you just need to simplify uh, the intentional clause for the implication and turn that to the disjunction that gives you the, the satisfiability condition for consistency. And then I don't recall the intentional bit, but it's much simpler than the proof I just showed you. Um, the other advantage is that since I'm pretty sure that this property, if A and B are not in R, then A and the negation of B are, are in R. Um, since we don't need that, then we, are at, we aren't at risk uh, of having hyperconnected models because the, the proof for the variance, I mean, for the convergence of both views uh, require this property in order to run. So, and then, but since we all, we still have uh, B1 and B2, the satisfiability condition for the arrow sort of implies a incompatibility uh, between the antecedent and the negation of the consequent. That was very important for, at least for me, because, you know, I was trying to um, get as many of the philosophical ideas about consistency, um, about Nelson, uh, I mean, of Nelson's philosophical ideas into the semantics. So that was perhaps the only reason why I really didn't want to go this way, but I get that um, I really didn't want to have hyperconnected models also, so uh, the choice was pretty clear. Um, something that was not that cool about this switch was that if I only went with the change in the satisfiability condition for the implication, then that would mean that I could no longer obtain um, implication from the inconsistency connective, unless I changed those uh, satisfiability condition as well, because uh, changing the condition for Inco inconsistency would also mean changing the one for consistency, since those are interdefined as well. So I just went ahead and did it, right? So we can modify the conditions for the intentional vocabulary. So as before, we only switch, um, like we only get, we only need to change the intentional clauses. So since the implication has A and B R in R as its uh, implication of clause, then for inconsistency, we'll have to switch that for the negation of R. And then my least favorite bit was that that will have to mean that the consistency connective would have to have a negative intentional condition. Right, so you'll get that either A and B are true or A is not uh, related or is not compatible with the negation of B. And I mean, I suppose that we can like see how this means sort of the same like you can still get um, the message, right? That if A and the negation of B are not related, this is because A and B are, but I don't know, it just doesn't sound as nice to me, I guess. Okay, so that was the good, the bad and the ugly, which I just figured out there recently. And since that was the final part of this talk, we can sum up. So we've gone over at my first attempt at the semantics for NL, which that's Nelson's logic, and the very recent discovery that 
its models, well, rather than it is, its models are hyperconnected. Um, I've shown you my best attempt as a solution, which I think will likely be the permanent solution, but then two threads are left hanging. I haven't really made the work to like verify that every other proof runs smoothly. Since this is just a matter like of switching the intentional clauses and we are going to preserve interdefinability given that I changed all of the satisfiability conditions rather than just one, I think this will be okay. And that I will only need to check like the relevant bits of the proof just to see that everything hangs together. But well, I, it still need, it's still a work that needs to be done. Um, and finally, once I do that, if I find out that the proofs actually hold, I'll start working on soundness and completeness results. My very first, so yay. Um, and then in the process of both uh, working on the draft and uh, thinking about these uh, connected relating logics, I've just figured that there might be uh, uh, some other area to, for discussion. Uh, for instance, I sort of realized that I had included, uh, as you can see in my first attempt at least, I had included all five properties. So you got A1, A2, B1, and B2 for the connected principles, and then you also got closure under negation although I wasn't even sure what I was using it for and whether, uh, whether you had like the, the appropriate theorem on the, on the axiomatic side of things. So I went to, I think my most current version of the proof for antilogism and I realized that it doesn't really depend on closure under negation. And I'm pretty sure that the proof of contraposition, which appears as a theorem in Nelson's logic, uh, follows from antilogism. So that really got me wondering whether I really needed to add closure and the negation uh, to the properties of R. But then again, since very recent developments, I have to check. I have to check all my proofs. So it might turn out that. I do need it. Uh, also, I realized that uh, C1 gives you the ability to have uh, this formula as a theorem in your model. And I'm pretty confident that this can be proved in Nelson's logic, but I'm also not sure because I don't really have a proof of it. So this is stuff um, I also need to work on. And finally, um, since the consistency connective ends up with such an unusual satisfiability condition, I started thinking about um, connective logics, which would have like pretty standard intentional, conditional, and conjunction, as in the example of like plane relating logics. I don't think it would be closely related to to Nelson's logic, or maybe it would, maybe it would be, uh, maybe it would turn out that Nelson's logic is a subset of this logic or something like that, because my guess is that things such as restricted transitivity and um, some other restrictions that Nelson's, that Nelson places wouldn't hold. So, I'm now interested um, on this question. And I also figured that since you would have uh, interdefinability between the conditional and the conjunction, um, maybe this logic could also end up being related to Routley's basic connected logic, which is presented in ternary relation semantics. And it's pretty, pretty, complicated and obscure because you have a relation R for the implication and then you have a relation, a ternary relation S for the conjunction and then they both like mingle together. So I haven't figured out that one quite 
I haven't quite figured that that just fit. So I would really like to know, like, once you get such uh, simple semantics as in relating logic, if that could help clarify, like, the relations between all of these connected logics. And, um, well, that's it. Thank you very much.